Well, everybody, welcome back to The Gut Hustle, episode 12. Yeah, it's 12 now. John Henry. Zach Williamson. So before we get started, we did want to talk to you. We are both realtors in central Pennsylvania. So if you do have anybody that's looking, you're looking, buying, selling, investing, just reach out to us. Our information's below. We're here to help, and that's we love our careers. Yep. Yeah, it's the best way to support the podcast. If you know anybody in the area who's who's looking and they, they need help and they're looking for their first house, just let us know. Yep. Yep. And today, big episode for me because we are joined by a local legend. A local legend? <laughs> he is a local legend. You are a local legend. It makes uh, me feel old. Uh, well, I don't think you're much older than me. But from Bel Air, Maryland, mm-hmm. went to Dayton University. University of Dayton, correct. Yep, university, just lost, excuse me. University. Just lost at yes, the they did. Uh, oh, and, Sad. Um, Bracket oh, well. buster right yeah. now. Yep. <laughs> and we got um, uh, Channel 21, CBS News, Chief Meteorologist Tom Russell, um, how you doing? I'm doing great. I'm excited to be here. I didn't realize I was top 20. I'm number 12. I yes. made the, I oh, made the yeah. top 20 here. Yes. Yeah, I'll hey, take it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Hey, you're better than a baker doesn't, let me tell you. <laughs> yeah. Well, a few of the episodes are just me and John, too. So really, yeah, you're, in yeah, you're, you're in the top 10. I'm in the top 10. You're in the top 10. We yeah. keep talking. I'll keep moving up. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there's, a, there's a Seinfeld episode about that. Did you That's ever right. see that? <laughs> he's moving up on the dial. He's like, on everybody on the phone. Yeah. Two? You're too young for that anyway. Yeah, I don't, I don't know what you're going to start. Oh. I, did, I did want to start. I want to talk about how you and I met. Okay. And um, and I don't know if you'll remember it, but I remember it very, very, very vividly. So I was nominated for Harrisburg Man of the Year. Louis, keep me a little phone, as I said. Correct. Yep. Um, Sophia Nelms from Sophia's right. is the one that nominated me. And I was five years sober at the time. Life was going really well. I'd had a really great year just emotionally, mentally. I was, you know, half a decade sober and at the final event, I did a speech. Yeah. And you em- emceed at, at the Penn Harris Hotel. Yeah. That is correct. At Penn Harris, you emceed the event. Then I went up in front of I don't know, 500 people and talked about how five years ago I was a criminal. I was a liar. I was a thief. I was a drug addict. And it was a really one of the first times I was extremely vulnerable in front of a lot of people that I didn't know. Yeah, I didn't know your story. Yep. And as soon as I was done, he literally like came up, shook my hand and whispered. He's like, that was a great speech. And that Aww. to me was very monumental in me feeling better about just being more and more transparent about my sobriety Yeah, and the ability to share that. Well, it had to be so hard for you to be that vulnerable. I mean, it's one thing you share with a friend, but you're in front of 500 people on this journey that, you know, could have gone awry at any point. And you, yeah. I was really amazed. So yeah, thank you. kudos to you. Yeah, thanks. And my dad was there, and I remember just his face the whole time because I remember what his face looked like years before that, and it was all disappointment. Really? So just to kind of see that, and uh, it was a really, really, really cool event. And wow. that's when I kind of started to really follow you and understand, okay, he's not just a meteorologist. He's not just a news anchor. He does a lot of community work and a lot of MC work, which I think yeah, is cool. Yeah, that's awesome. That's, well, that's really, really cool. I, I just think it's so important, and that's one of the things I love what you, you guys are doing is trying to highlight the positive. The yeah. world is so negative, I, especially I'm in the news business. It's like <laughs> oh, I'm <laughs> so negative all the time. You like, probably see it literally all the time. All the time. So we, you have to accentuate the positive, and there's so much positive right here in Central PA, and you guys are doing a great job highlighting that. Yeah, there really is, yeah. and that's that's kind of our goal. Like we said, originally this was real estate, and after about two episodes, we're like, nah, that's boring. Like, yeah. uh, let's try yeah. something different. Let's focus on cool stuff, and that's yeah. uh, kind of the route we took. So Yeah, yeah. yeah and that's the tough thing, too, is like there's a big temptation. I forget what they say, like sadness sells. Whatever. You probably know the difference. Sure. But if it bleeds, it leaves. If it bleeds, it leaves. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so there's, there's a big temptation to just get like the most crazy, right. chaotic story out there. Right. Um, but like you said, I think I think it's really important that we highlight the good and and – there's no, there's enough negative out there, right? Like, oh my so gosh, to be yes. different is actually to pivot back into <laughs> like let's talk about something awesome, right? Good is the new bad, huh? <laughs> yeah, good is the new bad. It really <laughs> is. It, it really is. is. <laughs> right. Awesome. So, all right, Tom, Fire I away. have a burning question for you before Uh-oh. we start. Okay, Uh-oh. this has bothered me for literally my entire life, and I just I I never took the time to Google it, so I just want you to answer this for me, okay? So, and and you're gonna think this is silly, okay? So, um. <laughs> There's a lot of disclaimers here, Joe. Oh, I know. Yeah, yeah. Well, a lot of, a lot of, he's <laughs> also the, he's the child of the. Yeah, okay. yeah, I'm the baby here. Okay, okay so so meteorologists. Mm-hmm. Okay, they study the weather, Correct. not meteors. Okay, <laughs> they do not study <laughs> meteors. Okay, correct. And the study of meteors, and I was doing all kinds of Google last night. It's called okay. meteorist or something like that. There's some kind of weird. I, I don't even know how to say it. Um, so I've always wondered why aren't they just called weatherologist instead of meteorologist, right? And then uh, I looked it up, and apparently you can just call people 
like yourself, weatherologist too. It's like a synonym <laughs> for meteorologist. I haven't heard that. And but. so, so I just want to know, in your opinion, what the heck is going on? Why, why are they, why are they meteorologists and not weatherologists? Well, I, the way we always learned it was meteor has to do with the sky, and ology is the study of. So it was basically the the study of the sky. Oh, that makes but when sense. you talk about right. meteors, then you're talking about more geology with these, yeah. you know, fa- fragments coming down and, and hitting the earth. So here's another little tip for you. It's a meteor if it's flying through the sky. It's a meteorite if it touches the earth. Really? Oh, yeah. Interesting. Oh, there you go. So that now, gives me a little more peace. All right, another little <laughs> trivia for you. So raindrops in our world aren't just raindrops. They're hydrometeors. Okay. Uh, what? Hydrometeors. That's what you guys Hydro- call them, too? In the, but yeah. In the, why in why the, can't they just be raindrops? <laughs> well, <laughs> for, you, for you and me, they are. <laughs> yeah, that's your meteor. little, your little layman's So there, there's the your meteor. Uh, you know, <laughs> all the fine. stuff that comes from the, the sky is a meteor, so. All right. Nice, nice. Well, that that yeah. makes me feel a little bit better. That, that's kept me up many nights, <laughs> as you can tell. You have no life, Zach. <laughs> I know. Yeah, that's so true. <laughs> oh, it's going to be okay. <laughs> oh, sorry. I'll, All right. I'll, I'll, I'll. All right. So you, you grew up in Bel Air. Uh, Maryland, yeah. Maryland? So just south of here, yep. Yep, just south of here. I'm not the Prince of Bel Air. No, no, no. <laughs> totally different Bel Air. Yeah, yes, yes. Um, he's more West Philadelphia Bel Air. Yeah. Um, right, right. But right. anyway, so what was it like? What were you like growing up? What was it like down there? Uh, last of nine kids. Um, so we had this huge family. But I was so young, I'm uh, 15 years younger than my oldest brother. Wow. So I didn't know a lot of my older siblings, you know, firsthand. They were already gone and out to college by the time. My mom always told the story that uh, one day man knocks at the door and I'm like, Mom, there's a strange man at my door. It was my brother who was coming home from college, my oldest brother. I didn't even know my oldest brother. <laughs> oh, my gosh. That's real? That's real. That's crazy. Wow. Real. So, uh, so being the last of nine was always, you know, you had to fight for food. You had to, you know, you got the last of everything. Now, they'll tell you a different story that I was a spoiled one, but we all know that ain't true. <laughs> that ain't true. So uh, growing up in Bel Air was great. Um you know, went to a Catholic school for a while and then back to public school and just had a, a pretty normal uh, uh, life growing up. Yeah, were you a Colts fan? Uh, yes, definitely. Baltimore Colts fan to the oh, core. Yeah. That's right, they were um, Baltimore. So uh, one of the most traumatic things in my growing up. 1983? 1983. Uh, 84, 84. 84. Yeah, the Mayflower. March of 1984, you wake up and you see on the news that this Mayflower van is pulling out of Owings Mills, Maryland, and the Colts are gone. Yeah, do you know this? Just yeah, gone. I, yeah. So yeah. imagine a little kid growing up with, Johnny Unitas and Bert Jones, and then all of a sudden they're just gone. They're like, vanish. how does this happen? And they're going to Indianapolis. So at the time, they were you weren't allowed to say that. You had to call them Indian No Place. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least the same year, roughly, you got Cal, because his rookie year was 83. Right. So then everything was Orioles, Orioles, Orioles. Yeah. And then yes. they built a new stadium, and the, the focus really changed to them. But yeah, I remember they had no football team in Baltimore for a long time. Yeah, yeah I was going to say, time. when did the Ravens even show up? I don't even remember. So the Ravens came back as, well, they, they were, were the Browns, Browns right. uh, in 96, 97, yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's crazy. That is crazy. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, you grew up there, you were the youngest. When did you start, like, actually thinking about broadcasts and weather and mm-hmm. all that stuff? Yeah, I, you know, I was obsessed with radio. That was my thing, man. I just oh, radio. Be, well, you oh, still yeah. do radio. Absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. That's my first love. And, and, and now podcasting has kind of grown into that. But, man, right. I just wanted to be the best DJ there was. And um, in Baltimore, we had a top 40 station called B104. And I just, uh, everything I wanted to do was be at that station. So um, I went to college and I wasn't sure whether I was going to be a, a police officer. That was my one thing. Yeah. Okay. Or a uh, broadcast. And, uh, you know, those are you, wildly different. By they the are, but um, <laughs> both sounded cool to me at the time. <laughs> it's not trendy. Yeah. <laughs> so when I got to college, I checked out what the graduating, uh, you know, police officers were doing, you know, criminal justice majors, and they were all patrolling malls. There just was an opportunity at the time. Right. Got a job at the college radio station, and that was it for me. That's freaking oh, okay. In, in the univer- at, in Dayton. In Dayton, yeah. Which actually, if people have ever been to Dayton, it is an amazing town. Thank you for saying that. It is a cool it, little town. The museums, especially, they have the that, Air Force. Yeah, the Wright Patterson Air Force Base. Yeah, <gasps> it is. It's I mean, tremendous. This is the, probably, and I lived in Paris for a couple summers or whatever. Right. That museum is one of my favorite places I've ever been because wow. it has like pre war, like World War yep. One, World War Two, post World War Two, and then new air, high tech stuff, high tech stuff, and then they have a huge area where you go in and it's all rockets. Yeah, space. Oh, really? Oh, it's as good as the Air and Space Museum in that's cool in Florida. Like you stand yeah, yeah, yeah. and you look up and there's two three hundred foot rockets inside yeah. of a building, full scale. Wow. You know, 
I yeah. hope my sister's probably been there because she does she does rocket science stuff literally oh, at your yeah, yeah, Space yeah. Coast in yeah. Orlando. Oh, no kidding. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Very cool. And that's actually cool. where the plane they brought JFK in after he was shot. Is that in plane that, is in, in the that, museum. In that right? museum. Yep. Yeah, we that's got correct. to tour that, which was... Yeah, yeah, they let you go through it. You're right. Yeah, yeah. that's crazy. But anyway, okay. Dayton so, is a great town. So, yeah. so how did you figure out, like, okay, you're, you're in school, you start the radio, and then you mm-hmm. get into news? No, it wasn't that simple. Uh, news took a little bit longer. So my first TV job, uh, so I'm doing radio, and I, you know, you branch out from the college station, you start working at the local stations. So I would give up my Friday and Saturday nights to do overnight DJ at the local radio station. Oh, okay. So there was a lot of parties and stuff I missed out on at college <laughs> because, you know, it'd be 11 o'clock, and I'm like, oh, I got to go. Where are you going? I'm going to do the midnight to 6 a.m. shift over, mm. you know, a half hour away. Um, so I really sacrificed a lot, but by my senior year, I got this opportunity. This is going back before, uh, Fox had all the kids programming in the afternoon. So back then they were independent TV stations and they were starting to look for afternoon programming and they had cartoons and stuff. And then a lot of these smaller cities like Dayton or whatever would have a local host. Mm -hmm. So I got to try out to be the local host for the cartoons every afternoon. That's kind of awesome. That is awesome. And it worked perfect because at the time you would go and you would tape like a week's worth in one day. So I didn't have to miss a lot of- Oh, nice. It was a lot of work time per se, but you yeah. taped these little segments. So what you realize in college is how many college kids were watching cartoons in the <laughs> afternoon. Because I'd walk around campus and say, you're the dude on the cartoons, man. <laughs> no way. <laughs> so that, that was my awesome. first TV gig. That's that pretty cool. That would be for sure. Yeah, that's yeah. pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, that's I awesome. thought it was pretty cool. I mean, it was pretty silly looking back at it, but it was like. So what was your favorite uh, cartoon then? Uh, I, you know, I didn't even know half the programs because yeah. I was in class when they yeah. were running yeah. <laughs> when it was there. Yeah, I did so <laughs> I, I love that story. Yeah. So I guess like um, a kind of like broader question here. So how does someone like I'm sure someone at home r- r- right now watching this is probably thinking like, how does someone actually get into like the broadcast scene? Is it is it really like like that way where you kind of get into different smaller gigs and kind of work your way in? Is that kind of. Well, it's really changed, and it's really it's dramatically changed since COVID. You know, growing up, every kid wanted to be on TV or on the radio. That was a cool thing. But now these kids have grown up literally on a screen yeah. Yeah, since they were 12. Right. So right. the whole idea of being on TV, no big deal, you know? So we're having <laughs> actually having trouble finding people to go into broadcasting. Is that right? Yeah. But back in my day, boy, I sound old. Um <laughs> You know, there'd be 10 people lined up for every job, and you had yeah. to audition, you had to prove yourself, and it was really, really tough to break in. So to answer your question, a lot of people worked their way from radio to TV because they already had the the presence, the mic presence, the being able to uh, improvise, that sure. kind of thing, would translate well to becoming a reporter. So that was kind of my path. Uh, it took me, I did radio for eight years and then didn't do TV um, until I was 28. Well, I saw... Like, I can remember as a kid, it was always, on the news, it was the same people. Whether it was ABC, 21, it was, I never saw new faces. I see new faces all the time now. Exactly. I do. Like, the turnover rate seems to be higher. Like Mm. you just said, it's harder to get people in. But now that I'm looking at it, I'm thinking, my gosh, I'll watch, you know, ABC or 27 or or 21, 8, 40, Foxworth, and I'll see new faces all the time. I'm like, I don't don't know who that person is. Well, you know, it used to be, to Zach's point, you'd spend two or three years in a market and then you'd move up. So you'd move. Okay. Up, uh, move around the country to move up. You know, you'd start in a smaller market like Harrisburg and you go to Philly or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, now, if you're any good, you can go right to Philly, <laughs> right to Baltimore and those wow. kind of places. But you're, to your point, there was a lot of stability and the ratings reflected that because it was like somebody, your friend was in your living room every night. Um, you know, there was a trust there that was so important. And we're losing that as broadcasters, I think. Yeah, because you're one of the long standing broadcasters locally I yeah mean, you 22 years here alicia yeah. richards and right. Renelle from eight and, and she just left yeah she so, just left yeah and she really, she's yeah, running she, for congress yeah. and then i'm wow. actually friends with uh dennis owens too because i've coached yeah him. great I, guy yeah awesome i've coached his kids in sports and he refs over at upward so kind of building relationships with you and him has been always pretty fun too and i got to i actually got to meet and hang out with greg mace a lot back in the good day guy. Uh, yeah, yeah it was a shame when guy. he passed but sure what a, what an amazing man yeah but like yeah. I said, the turnover rate just seems a lot different. And we talked about that before the show started, just like. Broadcasting is changing. It's literally changing. And, you know, because, you know, with a microphone and a camera, you guys can do the same thing we can. 
Yeah. Uh, so as broadcast, we've got to really up our game, and I'm not sure that we are sometimes. What do you, you, what do you think is missing right now? Like, because I, I would imagine if I were one of the higher up guys, and again, I'm, I'm 28, I'm naive, right? But I would imagine if I were one of the higher up guys at one of these stations, I'd be saying, guys, like, we need to, we need to revolutionize this a little bit. What, what do you think is holding it back? Oh, just the old way of thinking. You know, there was broadcast just to dumb it down for you there was cbs cbs would pay the local affiliate a certain amount of money every year to be an affiliate so you just had this constant income well a couple of years ago that all ended so the whole idea of broadcast network model is over so what happened was with all the um digital stuff mm-hmm. tv stations aren't selling 30 second spots in the six o'clock news anymore they're selling ads yeah, some of yeah. that's going to be on Facebook. Some of that's going to be on digital. Some of that's going to be on your show. Uh, right. So you're all selling the same stuff. Mm. So there isn't that money being poured into the 6 o'clock news per se. So we as broadcasters want to sell, just like you guys do, your brand, right? Right. And so, yeah, we want to be your trusted source. But as a consumer, what changed over the last 10 years, we went from a push model where, hey, here's the news, to I want to watch what I want when I want to watch it. Yeah, right. change the game. Right, we're way behind the eight ball on that. So, if you look at history of broadcast, go back to 2004. Okay, mm-hmm. no, no phone yet, right? 2004. Who has the biggest screen? Mm-hmm. Who has 4K? Who's going to be the biggest thing? So, what did every station do in the early 2000s? They went HD. We're HD. They put tons of money into new cameras, slides, sets, everything. Right. Yeah. And what happened two years later? iPhone comes out, mm-hmm. and all you want is your news on this little device. Right. Oh. Yep. And we're putting all this money into big screens and fancy mm-hmm. cameras and sets. Mm-mm. The consumer said, no, I want my news here when I want it, not at 6 o'clock, not at 11 o'clock. Yeah, right, right. So broadcast, and I'm generalizing, missed the boat, and we're still playing catch up from that. Because I remember I didn't get my first real smartphone until 2000. Nine or ten, I'd been in the business like two years, and I think that's when I got like my first iPhone. Right. Um, and but you're right. Like I don't, I I watch the news on this, right. or I watch a lot of stuff on here. I mean, I have a big screen TV in my living room, and sometimes I'm sitting there watching my phone. <laughs> <laughs> well, we call that the secondary screen. Yeah. Yes. So how do we? You know, that went from the primary screen to this oh. was the secondary to this is primary. That's secondary. Yeah. So how do we stay relevant yeah. as broadcasters? So we got to bring something else to the table. Right. And then specifically in my world, you can look at your phone and see a week's worth of weather. So right. I got to bring something different to the table, you know, that says, hey, I got to watch Tom tonight. He might be able to tell me, you know, something yeah. that, that I don't know. Right. And, but I will, I do follow you and I follow you on Facebook. I follow you on Instagram and I do love seeing your posts because it's not yeah, just. Yeah, but what did you just say? You don't want to sit down and watch the news. No, but I follow you. Well, yeah. <laughs> but to see how our world has changed. Yeah, you know, it used 100%. to be like, hey, John's but a you're fan. Like, he sits down at 6 and 11 and watches me. No. That's my dad not does. I <laughs> well, yeah. Tell your dad I appreciate I will, it. <laughs> but I will tell you, like, but I, but you're right. When you're selling ad space, you're selling ad space. You're not selling a commercial. Correct. I Correct. see your stuff on Facebook. That's where I'm going to find your ads. Right. Okay. Right. That makes sense. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So that whole dynamic has changed, and it, it really changed how the money flowed. The money's still flowing. Right. It's just flowing in different channels. Yeah. Yeah, so do you have um, – so I was talking to Taylor the other day, and she was telling me that – because somebody said that they like my voice on this show. Like, I've had lots of people say John that. has a great voice. You do have a good voice. I yeah. don't understand that. I've always thought it was a weird voice. So when I was <laughs> – I mean, I think we all say that. So, like – but he came up with a good question. He's like, did you come up with a news voice? Do you have a news voice, or is it your just voice? Oh, yeah. No, I definitely have a news What's, voice. Can, can you give well, us a preview <laughs> of the news voice? You, you got to remember that in, in the beginning, like my professors in college, the guy was a vocal coach. Like wow. the, That art has been lost, but yeah. being able to pronounce things. Like here in Pennsylvania, there's something, and I don't know where it comes from. It's mainly northeast Pennsylvania, but words like mitten, oh, and mitten. Manhattan, <laughs> yeah. and Manhattan. that stuff. Like if you said that, you would not get the job. Yeah. Oh, you hear that all the time now. Wow. Weird uh, pronunciations of stuff. And that oh, was yeah. a big deal. I like worse. <laughs> yeah, seriously. Yeah. You know, one of the things they try to work out of you when you're coming up in, in radio in the 70s and 80s, like I was, no accents, uh, no ethnic names. Oh, you, really? Oh, yeah. Like, I had like 16 different radio names, you know, and there's always three syllables. Like, one was Tommy Nicks. 
I could uh, see that. One was, yeah. you know, Tom yeah. Russell. It sounds like a, like a lead singer in a band. Type right, name. exactly, yeah. exactly. But now the more ethnic, the better. The You know, yep. the diversity is important. So um, that's really, really changed. But the, the diction, dialect, all that stuff was in very emphasized where like it's not you, now. You would have been scolded if you had been like in... Uh, we're gonna have a cool spring day coming in, so if you want to open up your window, go window. ahead. <laughs> window, be like, no, Windows you will not say that. I remember um, I learned that from my father. I'm a big uh, Dave Ramsey fan. Okay, um, right. Yeah, I, I grew up on in like uh, you know in the church and everything. Sure. And we saw Financial Peace University and all that. And I remember one of the things Dave Ramsey always said was he had to take the Southern draw out of everything whenever he first got on the radio. He had because everyone said that he, everyone thought he he said that he thought that everyone thought that he was stupid. Yeah, just because, the way, he because of the way he talked. Yeah, and so was, they wouldn't believe his advice oh, yeah. until he in, sounded less Southern. Any kind of accent you had to get rid of. Yeah, I'm a big Dave Ramsey fan, too. But yeah. sometimes his, his Southern stuff comes out. Oh, yeah, you <laughs> hear it. When he gets angry. Yeah, yeah, when he gets mad, <laughs> he loses the radio voice. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, so my radio voice would be more like this. So thanks for watching. Oh, that's, <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. Because you, um, you work with what's his name on the radio? And why am I drawing Glenn Beck? Glenn Beck, and then um, the local guy, um, R.J. Harris. Oh yeah, so I fill in for R.J. when I can. So when I first came to town here, uh, I'm sorry, the um, uh, iHeart radio stations were all in one place, and I, I still like to, to DJ. And what changed in the DJ world was being able to to come in and voice track, where you could put your 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 breaks on the computer and then a computer would just play them. You didn't have to physically be there. So when I first came, I was on Bob 94.9 and then I got friendly with RJ and then I uh, got to fill in for him. So radio is still my first love. So I, I really, really enjoy that. Yeah. I was on RJ's show a couple of times, which was cool during that process of the man of the year thing, which had nothing, oh, right, right, I've right. said this on the show before had nothing to do with me. Just, <laughs> just raising money. It was, I was not a man of the year. I was just, it's just a stupid title that I did not deserve. Okay. So we were, so we were talking, um, as, as you got here about, um, mm-hmm. how I was, you know, I do a lot of Googling and research and stuff for all these interviews. And I was reading some fascinating stuff about your background. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't remember what the website was. It was some kind of obscure thing that you were doing, but, um, you had the opportunity to work with some household names. So one of them was uh, Casey Kasem. No, I didn't work with him. Not, not oh, really? directly. No, not directly. Oh, okay. I I had seen that on a website. Or no, something. Yeah, no, he's a, he's a hero of mine, but okay. not, uh, not directly. Maybe that's what it was. But yeah, I also Do you remember a guy the... named Rick Dees? Oh, yeah. Rick Dees yeah. at the Top 40 Countdown. Now, he was my real hero because he mm. – Casey Kasem was fantastic, but yeah. he was very straightforward. Like, here's the record, here's the thing. Yeah, yeah. Rick Dees tried to do bits. Like, he was trying to be oh, funny okay. and stuff. Yes, Rick Dees was great. Rick Dees was out of L.A., so uh, Rick Dees, if you go way back to our time, he had a he actually had a record, a hit record called Disco Duck. Okay. Uh, <laughs> anyway, he was one of these DJs that really pushed the envelope. So, so yeah. Rick Dees was a was a hero. And then of course uh, Glenn Beck. And then Glenn right. Beck was a was a huge. Uh, now Glenn Beck was still a top forty DJ when we worked together. Mm-hmm. So the Glenn Beck that you know now is nothing like right the Glenn Beck that I work with. Right. He was horrendous to me. He was terrible. He was uh, really. Oh yeah, yeah. And and similar to your story, <laughs> I was part of his twelve step process. Where uh, when he got sober, he came back to me and apologized for uh, how wow. he treated me. And that's why I have so much respect for him because he's so authentic. Like he, he lived that. He went through it. Yeah, and and I can tell you like that the twelve step process. No matter if whatever yeah, program whatever. you're in, um, that has been the biggest saving grace for me. And I mean, obviously, just putting down drugs and alcohol, but. Like you said, making amends of relationships, right? And they're not him making amends to you wasn't necessarily for you. It was yeah, to help him, him heal himself, right? And but when it reflects on him like that, and you look at him in a completely different light, which people still, I I have friends that know the real John, and they're like, I just I see you on like <laughs> Facebook and, and I can't videos, believe it. I'm you, just right? like. That's not the guy. I'm like, yes, it is, but yeah. But that's what I love about your story. You're so authentic, and, and you're trying to, both of you guys trying to highlight positivity here because I think what's being lost in society is that once you made that bad turn or that wrong choice, you're done. No. Yeah, right. No, man. Life is about redemption. It's about reinventing yourself. It's about the term that I've been using lately, and it's not my term, but Doing the next right thing. Yeah, do exactly. the next right thing. I was telling my kids, you know, oh, dad, I screwed this up. I can't. No, do the next right thing. The next time you get to make a decision, do the right thing. Yeah. And so many of us miss that where it's like today is the day, perfect day to turn your life around. Yeah. Do it. Yeah, my my sister, she'll have, um, 
She'll have five years in two days. Wow. And I thought, I've lost her a thousand times mentally. Like she was my best friend and I had 10 years when she finally got sober. And she has just turned into this amazing human being. And we always knew there was something in there, but we didn't know what it was. We just, just weren't sure. And then she just got a huge award this weekend. Really? Like she has a great job. She bought a house like which would have never we would have never thought this in our lives but like i said she just one day changed her stars wow and and i've seen a lot of people do it and i've seen a lot of people die in the process i really have that have really tried and addiction whether it's i don't care if it's food gambling drugs alcohol man is it hard right it's hard That's why it should be celebrated when people overcome. I just exactly. look at you. I mean, look, look what we're doing now. Yeah, yeah. No. I wouldn't have done that 10 years ago. Yeah. How cool is it? Yeah, and I can tell you, no, nobody's ever been like, ew, sober. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. <laughs> you don't get that reaction. Yeah. No, no, but I, 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 but I'm also, I just saw a girl post today, um, just mental health. And like I said, like we talk about that a lot on here too, because it's not talked about enough. Yep. And it's a, it's a word that is looked down upon, like I'm mentally sick, like, if you know me, you know I got problems. Like you just do. Like people know me, they're like, yeah, I think there's everyone something. Does. There's, everybody does, but there, but there's something that I suffer with, and I suffer from mental illness, and I suffer from uh, just all sorts of different things. And but I'm here to talk about it. Like when right. you say like this show, we just want to make a difference. We want to be positive. Well, that's great. You guys are yeah. doing it. But to your point, my my middle daughter just started teaching first grade, yeah. and she was talking about, uh, you know, these kids even at that age, are way behind because of COVID. Yeah. And there's so much mental issues that come from what the kids went through in COVID because all my daughters were right in the wheelhouse for that, mm-hmm. missing school, right in college and high school and all that. And I think you're going to see these lasting impacts, unfortunately negative, yeah. until these kids can get past some of those issues. So you're right in being able to talk about it because I think if it, you know somebody hears somebody else going, hey, I went through that and I got through it, here's how I got through it. Those stories are so important, but I, man, I see it in my own kids, and I'm like, "Why are you struggling with this?" Right. But I didn't go through what they went through. No, through, yeah. you know, I went through my own thing through COVID, but they went yeah. to a completely different thing. But yeah, so. I can't even imagine if if part of my childhood was the lockdown like that. That would that would mess up your whole trajectory. Right. Right. Like, right. I mean, completely. Yeah. Completely. I went to Giant every day with a mask on, just so I could just walk around a building, just to get out. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I, I will admit I did it. I always needed some. And by the way, guys, if you're enjoying this episode of the Good Hustle Podcast, please go ahead, leave a like, subscribe on the YouTube, and also... We are on Spotify and Apple Podcasts now, so um, if you want to listen without the video part, you can do that. Yep, and if you're looking for any real estate needs, whether you're buying, selling, or investing, please contact Zach or myself. Our numbers are below. Back to the podcast. But like, yeah. I can say, like, it was, for me, I have to, I can't, I'm never, I don't know the last time I ever sat at home an entire I day. Know. Like, I, we're always on the move. Right, yeah. especially as a real estate. In real estate, for sure. Uh, yeah. yeah. But I was at home, too. It was awful. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because everything was out. shut down. Yeah. I watched a, I was watching a replay of an NFL game the other day, and there was like thirty people in the stands. Oh, nobody in the stands. No, and and the people oh, has masks weird. on. I just thought, why? And that was only four years ago. Yeah. Like this is just four years this yeah. month. Yeah, which yeah. is crazy. So, kind of get back to your career a little bit. Right. Like, when when did you get on the news? Like, you got your first news job. Okay, so I had gone to San Diego as a radio DJ. And then uh, I was at a point in my career where I, I realized I need to either get a management in radio or get out and do TV. So I took a job in Panama City Beach, Florida, of all people. And you're Places, here. And I'm okay, like, let's, we'll get, we'll get cool. to that. <laughs> I, I would have stayed in Pan- Panama Beach if I were you. <laughs> so I was program director of a radio station, and one of the part-time DJs for me, a guy I worked on the weekend, worked full-time at the TV station. And um, when I was in San Diego... The radio station also housed a TV station. We were one uh, owned company. And I had cut a tape uh, doing weather. And, you know, just to see what would happen, it was kind of natural to me because the weather, you just, especially in San Diego, hey, it's sunny yeah. again today. Have a great day. <laughs> sunny, sunny <laughs> too. Talk to you tomorrow. <laughs> right. So I had this tape, and, I, and the guy came in one day. He said, hey, our weekend weather guy is leaving. Uh, would you be interested? So I gave him the tape, and I got the weekend weather job. Nice. Uh, and started doing weather. And shortly after that, like a matter of months, the morning weather person left and they said, Hey, do you want the job? Wow. By that point, I was getting a little um, disgruntled with radio and where it was going. Um, 
I said, sure. So I made the leap. I actually took a pay cut. And so I started doing weather in Panama City. And part of my deal was they would send me back to school for meteorology because I didn't, wow. okay. I didn't have a degree at that point. Right. So uh, I was working full time and getting my meteorology degree. That's awesome. Maybe yeah. You started work. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, you're good. I was I was just going to say I was I was thinking about this uh, on the way here, too, about like, I wonder if a lot of uh, guys who are into meteorology were kind of like almost like former radio guys or former actors or something like that, where they're like, hey, you're great on camera. You're great on a microphone. Just go learn this stuff real quick and come back. So I, I, that was interesting. There were two things going on at the time. This is, uh, you know, into the 90s now. So somewhere in the late 80s, when uh, Doppler radar became more prevalent, there was a push for your weather person to be a meteorologist, to be a scientist. Mm -hmm. So if you go back in time, you watch like Anchorman, the weatherman was literally the comic relief between the hard news and the sports. Right. So it was either a really pretty girl or a goofy guy or whatever. Yep. And it wasn't anything about the science. So through the 90s, as the technology got more sophisticated, it became important that you were a meteorologist. And then if you watch us, we have these little AMS seals, <laughs> the American Meteorological Society. AMS seal was important. Okay. Uh, so there was this big push to go from, you know, the comic relief to, to being a scientist. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so, so it became more science-y based. Very much. And, okay, interesting. So, so for, for me to pursue the career, I would have to have the meteorology degree. So that's why I did that. Yeah, okay. So what are some of the hardest, most like challenging aspects of, of what you do? Um, I think for me, I struggle when there's nothing going on. Like you know, <laughs> if you give me a week of sunshine, it's like my job is terrible because our job is to make it interesting, right? Yeah, right. And, and you're and like it's trying just, to make the most boring thing right, interesting. Right, yeah. So that's the biggest challenge. Um, but then when there's really stuff on the line, when there's really dangerous weather, there's flooding, you know, there's been several major events since I've lived here in central PA, uh, the Campbelltown tornado of 2004. Oh, I remember this. Uh, this was the worst thing I've ever covered. Uh, Campbelltown is a little town right next to Hershey. And, uh, it was uh, July of 04. And it was one of those days where the sky turned green. You hear about these situations and, you know, I'm on the air and I, I see this thing go through. we you know, warned people and you hope everything's okay. But shortly after we went right there and I was blown away. I mean, this was a fairly new neighborhood, country squire skates, uh, states it was called. Uh, and some houses were leveled and some houses were barely touched. Yeah. And it just blows your mind how nature can do that. So the one thing that sticks out to me, not in that neighborhood, but adjacent was a brick home. Like a, you guys sell two story or a one story brick home, right? You know how solid they are. A two by four was through the side wall, halfway through the side wall, lodged in the brick. Wow. So think about how fast a two by four had to be going to be lodged in the brick. Yeah. Over 200 miles an hour. Wow. So yeah. that blew me away. That, um, But the, the good thing about that situation was that community came together and they were they were back and up and running in, in a year or so, uh, you know, rebuilding those homes. The, those people in the community came so tight. <laughs> Um, you know, I remember taking my kids out. We took Gatorade and water to the workers. It was really neat to see how the community uh, came together on that. So that was a big one. And then the other one, uh, the flooding, there was two big floods. 2011. Uh, 11 and 04. 04 yeah. was really mm -hmm. big. Uh, 11 was Tropical Storm Lee. Um, and unfortunately, we're way overdue for another flood like that. Yeah, that uh, was yeah. that was the most the worst one I remember because of the zoo. Oh right, uh, that was where they lost some of the bison and yep. at uh, yep. at uh, Hershey Zoo. Yeah, if you go to that horses in Humblestown, you go inside. <laughs> there's the, a mark on there's the, a post yeah. inside the inside the restaurant. It's like water was here. <laughs> it was like my gosh, where the salad bar yeah. go? <laughs> <laughs> but it's true. And then uh, again, you see the community come back. But you know, living in the Susquehanna Valley, you're yeah. going to have those Things floods. It's yeah. Yeah, I remember. Um, did you cover uh, Hurricane Sandy at all? Sure. Yeah. Sure, yeah, sure. I remember. Um, I remember Hurricane Sandy was one of the worst days of my life. Um, not not seriously, but a little. But it was bad. Um, because I had just gotten a trampoline for the first time in my life. My dad had. I'm, I'm not. I'm not kidding, John. This was the worst. The worst how, thing. how old were you? Okay, so, like, like sixteen or fifteen. Or something. Oh my! Too old. Too old for a trampoline. Yeah, that's the so, best. Yeah, listen to this, okay? So we had this really tall basketball hoop that was one that was like um, built into concrete, okay? Okay. Um, it was like it was like a eleven foot or twelve foot hoop for some ungodly reason in the church parking lot. So me and my buddies were like, we're gonna take this trampoline, put it under this really tall basketball hoop, and we're gonna dunk on it all night. And then, oh, like, the I next see. day or two days later was Hurricane Sandy. 
<laughs> and then my trampoline were, was in the neighbor's tree with like 17 holes in it. Yeah. Wow. And I was so sad. So I had a trampoline for like three days. Wow. And I was, I was yeah, so That's sad. God telling me. You were, you were yeah, God, God was not going to help me <laughs> dunk up the trampoline anymore. Well, people forget about Sandy. For us, it turned extremely cold on the backside of that. Remember, mm. it, was, it was an off-season uh, yeah. hurricane. Um, so by the time we got to West Virginia, it dumped snow. We were down into the low 30s. Um, yeah. On the backside of Sandy, people forget about that. I remember, I remember Ernesto. That might have been five or six. I don't remember. I went to a Penn State game, and it was thirty-five degrees, raining sideways. Wow! And we wore trash bags. So everybody had to wear a trash <laughs> bag. And I remember oh, driving man. home, and my buddy is like, had a truck for two days. This was the second day of his brand new truck. He wouldn't let us wear our clothes in the truck. We had to wear it was all wet <laughs> underwear the whole way home. Me and my buddy Adam. And I was like, dude, if we get pulled over. <laughs> this is going to be the worst thing that I like. <laughs> Cops can be like, where were you guys? Like, That's uh, funny. It was funny, but so I did. I did see something. Okay, you won an Emmy. Uh, yeah, I have. Uh, I think I have two Emmys. Two Emmys. Um, <laughs> Tell <so>. me, <laughs> how cool is that? It is pretty cool. Uh, so the Emmys, uh, the way they work in local television is you're you're split into regions. So we, okay. we'd be up against like Pittsburgh and Philly and um, Pennsylvania stations. Uh, so yeah, it, it is very satisfying. Um, you know, it's not something that you really seek out, but um, but the recognition it is, great. is great. It is pretty cool. And then we won a won a couple of years ago for overall weather coverage. So I forget what the event was, um, but it, it is satisfying because you know as much I, I I like being on TV. I like talking to people, but when you actually help people, you actually you know yeah get them through an event. Really satisfying. Amen. So, if I get an Emmy for that, have the um, uh, the uh, the weather weenies won any, <laughs> won any Emmys yet? Well, let's clear this up. You're talking about my dog. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, to be clear, <laughs> these are dogs. That's why I said it that way first. Uh, uh, yeah, my uh, I'm a I'm a big Dachshund fan. Oh my gosh. Uh, always had Dachshunds. <laughs> Uh, so for some reason, like you said, with the help of uh, Facebook and whatnot, people always ask me about my two dachshunds. So they're officially cool. known as the weather weenies. And that is the funniest thing um, I've ever heard. By the way, <laughs> <laughs> that is awesome. There's nothing wrong with that. Hey, dogs no. are man's best friends. So. Uh, people love them. People love them. I yeah, love them. no, that's great. awesome. That's so funny. So um, uh, this is this is probably a question you've heard a lot. So. Um, you always hear like, oh, the weatherman's always wrong. You can't trust what the weatherman says. It's, he says it's going to be 80. It's going to be 40 tomorrow with 10, in, 10 inches of, of snow. Course, like, all of this course. kind of stuff. So so can you tell us a little bit of like why why you think that has become like a, like a I don't know, a trope or like something people say all the time is like. Well, oh, first of all, let me put out stuff. there that a uh, baseball player hits 300 uh, and he gets yeah. millions of dollars, all right? <laughs> right? You know, he hits three out of ten, and he's amazing. If you're batting 500, it's pretty good. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Yeah. We, we I never eight, thought of it that way. We hit, we hit eight out of ten and get crap all the time. Right. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> so we, we really have the, the science and the technology has really gotten amazing. You go back to when I first started 30-some years ago, you know, if you could predict three days out, you're really good. Now, and then it became five. And now I'm telling you tonight on my seven day, what next weekend's going to be like. And we're pretty, pretty accurate. close. Yeah. So as you go out in time, obviously we're not, the skill level drops. But to answer your question, it usually has to do with that one incident where I was wrong. Mm. That's what you, as a viewer or a listener, right. focus on. You're like, I had a picnic plan that day. He said it was going to be sunny, and darn it, it rained on my thing. And then that is what lives on. I'll right? never forgive you, Tom, that kind of thing. And then around here, it's so like, I, I think uh, three to five inches. Okay, but how much? Like three to five inches of snow. Oh, but how much? And we're like, people hear what they want to hear. Like, yeah. if, if they want a big snow and you tell them it's three to uh, five, ah. Ah, ah, you're wrong, you're wrong. <laughs> or vice versa, you know, they want to know snow. You're like, no, this is going to be a big one. Nah, you're wrong. You're well, wrong. besides you is my favorite weatherman. The other best weatherman I know is my dad because he will tell me oh. what, what's happening no matter that's what. Good. I think he feels it in his hip. Well, that's the, there's a lot of truth to there, that. There, uh, there actually is, yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's all about air pressure. If you have arthritis and whatnot, those achy yeah. joints. That air's moving around in there. You feel it. Oh, yeah? You feel yeah. it. I always say animals are the best, though. When you drive along, you see, like... Oh, with the deer out? Yeah. You know something's coming. Deer's out. And or, I know that because yeah. I'm hunting. Yep, exactly. When that so, barometric, barometric pressure is up, they're, ooh, we want it over 30. The deer are moving, like, 30.38. Like, yeah, they're going to be up on their feet right before 
right before dark. They're going to be eating. I yep. love it. That's what we're hunting. <laughs> yep. Right. Yep. So we, so I've honestly, since I started hunting 10, 11 years ago, I've looked at the weather. Much more, more than, than weather. Yeah. I look at it all the time. And, and, and realistically, you're right. You know, probably Tuesday last week, looking at the weather, Saturday is going to be rain. I pretty much knew Saturday was going to be rain. Right. It ended earlier than I expected. Right. That, you know, which so happens. It, well, no, it's, as you get closer to the event, you can fine tune it. So, once yeah. it started at midnight Friday, then instead of morning, gonna, we thought it was going to start right, originally. Exactly. So, so start a little earlier is going to end. It's pretty a close. Early. Like you're, yeah. the weather's not that. Well, you, you got the science behind it is a lot better. It's a lot better, and it, I think it's, it's pretty accurate. Well, the problem is now we take it for granted because it's so good. Yeah. yeah, and then when it's wrong, it's like how could it be wrong? You yeah. know, like do you remember that snowstorm we had? Five years ago in November. Oh, the November 15th. I remember it well. It was right in the middle of the day. Middle of the day. Everybody went to work. So you had all, in Harrisburg's case, you had all those state workers that, and I was like the night before, don't go in Mm -hmm. because this is going to hit late enough where everybody goes in. Like 10, 11. Right, exactly. Right before lunchtime. And then everybody's going to let out early. And that's exactly what happened. And we got pounded. Pounded. And it was so, it was the timing could not have been worse because everybody was on the road. They all left at the uh, same time. Like, I actually had to, I did, I've done a, I'm going to rephrase, how do I say this? My aunt had passed and I did her funeral service oh. in that snowstorm. Wow. Yeah, what? but I can tell you, like my brother, we had the, the funeral was in Carlisle and for him to get down to Manchester, it was an eight hour drive that oh, day. Oh, it, it everything was that got, bad. Yeah, it got, everything got so messed up. So that messed was up. one of the craziest days that I can ever, because I don't. Once again, I don't watch the news, so I'm not always looking at up-to-date stuff. You're killing me with that line, I, I, Listen, I watch the news and I watch CBS 21 on my phone. I do. You can cut that, all right? Yeah, Just cut that can out. Can we edit that out? Yeah, edit that out. All right. So so besides, so you helping people and, like, explaining, like, hey, this is going to happen. Like, if more people were to listen, listen to that, right. you know, that's probably one of your most rewarding aspects of the job is, like, you can literally get people in position to be safe. Yes, and and hopefully people heed that warning because sometimes it is dire. I mean, it's rare, yeah. uh, and I always try to change my demeanor. Most people know me as a you know goofy, fun loving guy, whatever. Yeah. But when I get serious, hopefully you take it seriously. So um, I definitely try to not muddle that message when it's when it's that important. Yeah, what, what I was gonna what I was gonna say is like I I think one thing that's gotten really bad just in the news in general, not not just specifically with weather or anything, but like. Um, it's hard to tell when something is actually dire whenever everything is on dire, the news right. is like fire and brimstone and everything's, you know, going to hell or whatever, right? Like well, it's I think that's one of the tell. mistakes we've made as broadcasters and you know, there was a lot of times where we have an editorial meeting at three o'clock, getting ready for the five o'clock, and I'd be like, Hey, you know, it's gonna rain tomorrow. And then by the time it gets to the news, the way it's written is, it's going to rain tomorrow and you need to build an ark. And, and, <laughs> right. and then you, I, seriously, there's times I walked into my boss's office going, no, we can't yeah. be doing this. And I, oh, we have to. We have to get viewership up. But what you do is you ruin that trust that yeah, you build. Right, right. And that is so important. So you're not wrong in saying that, but somehow we need to find that that right medium, that right yeah. that right line where people are informed but not you know, scared or yeah, whatever. And, and the hard thing is, like, I, I feel like trust in media just in general, like a, like the whole, the whole industry, really even including podcasts like ours, is like there's, right. there's a lot of stuff that flies around on podcasts that is not good information too, right? Sure. Um, and I, I think one thing that's a huge problem is just, like, we, it feels like nobody can trust anything they read anymore. Mm-hmm. We all are kind of expecting the most polarized version of whatever's <laughs> out there. Yeah, it's full and so, this way or very this true. way. Nothing in the middle. And, yeah, very the, other, true. the other hard thing is, like, we click on it, right? So it's kind of our fault. For clicking on the most polarizing stuff, it is, in a way. but it's also the content generators' fault yeah, for, for right. positioning like that. You know, we got into this thing in TV. We mentioned it before. If it bleeds, it leads. It has to be. Yeah. You know, for me to catch your attention, like you guys don't really watch. That, I watch that you. first piece of video. <laughs> that first piece of video has to be catching. So one of the things right. we look for every day is what's the coolest piece of video we have, you know, even if it's a water skiing squirrel like it was in Anchorage. <laughs> uh, but we want you to stick around. So, yeah. you know, video is so important. And, and I think there's there's so much content out there that it's really hard. The other thing we're struggling with is uh, we don't we have to verify sources. We have to verify that oh, things yeah. happen. And now video just shows up on YouTube and Twitter or whatever, and they're like, well, you guys didn't have that video. Well, we needed to, A, get permission to use it. Yeah, that's B, so... this happened just a couple of weeks ago. There was a fight at, at Hershey, or uh, now Harrisburg High, 
and we were trying to get the video. And the video is all over the internet. Everybody's like, oh, how come you're not reporting on this? Um, because we still have to verify sources. And yeah. I think that goes back to your point. We don't trust anything because, hey, does this guy just have an agenda? Does this source just want me to get mad at this? Yeah. Um, so it's a real struggle as journalists moving forward. What's going to be that medium? Because we want to get that video out there too. Right. We want credit for for showing it to you first. TBS Twenty One locally is a news that people can trust. No, I appreciate that, and that's why people like and like when I do watch, it's I, I like watching you. Like I I think you're really good at your job, and well, I think you're you. entertaining, and like and it's somebody that I know that I trust. So like when I watch the news, it's you that well, makes yeah. me happy. Well, that's a big compliment because I you know I try to be as real on TV as a you know yeah in person so. So I understand that you're you're also a man of faith. You know, me and me and John are both Christians as well. Um, can you tell us kind of what influence in your career and in your life that that God has had? Um, my mom would be the biggest. She was uh, kind of the spiritual leader in my family, and we always went to church and always did that. But as I got into college and even in high school, I was involved with a group called Young Life. Yeah. Uh, oh, I know. Young I know. Life. Young Life. Yeah. And yeah, my friends in that. Yeah, really impactful. You know, I went on a couple of uh, summer trips with Young Life. Um, you know, and for me and my own spiritual growth was, you know, I always heard about God, always went to church, always knew about it. But at one of these Young Life camps, the guy got up and he spoke about what Christ did in the pain and suffering all the way to the cross. That just, I had one of my 16, 17, just blew me away. Mm. So that's why I always love being uh, this week, the Easter week, leading up to yeah. the Passion, because it's like, man, this is love in action. Not that you and I could ever do that, but oh, this right. is the right. ultimate man of action. You know, I'm going to love you till death. Mm -hmm. That just always blew me away. So when I was in college, I got involved with uh, Campus Crusade for Christ, which is the, you know, kind of the next extension of Young Life for for college kids, and. Um, but what I've tried to do as an adult, you know, as I got in the workplace, is how do you live that out? So I'll give you an example. In 2015, I went to Haiti with, mm -hmm. a, with a local group. And when you see poverty, like you think, I always tell people, think of the worst poverty you've ever seen, times it by 10. And this is what people were living in, yep. in Haiti. You can't help but want to help those people. Yeah. So I think it's so important as we walk in our Christian faith is we challenge ourselves and we put ourselves in those situations. Like I wouldn't have known that I, Haiti was that bad. Yeah. Um, yeah. I've been I, to Haiti. It's 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 rough over there. there. I bought yeah. I bought a whole bunch of artwork from a guy who was who was making it out of his out of this basically like a hut. Right. There. Yeah. Just to support them. Yeah. Uh, and I took my oldest daughter, and it and it really had an impact. Uh, and it's coming back to full circle because I guess you've seen what's happening in Haiti where the gangs have taken over. There was a young lady that went with us who decided to stay, and um, basically after the 2010 earthquake, there were a lot of kids with no parents. Mm. So she's actually fostered these kids and trying to adopt them, and she can't get out because they don't have the paperwork to get these kids out. Wow. Mm. So she's literally in this horrible situation, but she refuses to leave until she can get and the place where you get the paperwork has been taken over by gangs, and oh. she can't get that. So my point being is I think as we grow in our faith, we've got to put ourselves in situations that are outside our comfort zone, maybe not what we feel like doing, and it's that where that's where you grow. So every Tuesday I go to St. Francis, which is a mm -hmm. soup kitchen down in Allison Hill. And what I love about that is we meet a basic need at that point. Yep. We don't – ask the government to do it we don't we just go there and we hand out food right now we get it from the food bank and they're great um but i love being that point person and when i see that each week it's like my favorite part of the week yeah which is weird right it shouldn't be my favorite part of the week but i hand somebody a can of food and it makes a difference in their life and i'm like yeah dang look what i'm doing yeah and you that, know what i mean in perspective and you spoke about you know that the earthquakes in haiti in 2010 so I can tell you, I'm, I'm two years sober, and I did a mobile mission for um, the Bethesda mission. Okay. So Where you went around? At the night. Yeah. Yeah, like at like 11 o'clock at night, 10 o'clock at night, you drive around for like four hours, and you're delivering stuff to the homeless. And I can remember, and this was one of the most eye-opening experiences of my life. I remember going to visit a guy who lived under a bridge on a piece of cardboard. We gave him a cup of coffee. And all he could talk about, the only thing he could talk about was how bad he felt for the people in Haiti. Wow. 
You that's, look at his circumstance and that's like yep. blown away. Like, am wow. I, and then it makes me kind of feel bad. Like, I, you know, there's things that I don't need. And like, I need to have new perspective on life. And I, I have to focus on that all the time. But I think we as humans need to redo that all the time, especially yes. as Christians where you're yes. like, okay, I'm, you know, my focus is way off at this point. So I'm so glad you yeah. did that. And to that point, why aren't we making our young people do that? Know. You know, these kids need service hours and all this stuff. So I always yeah. try to get my kids, hey, come down with me to the soup kitchen for Absolutely. Not every week, yeah. but that I'm, should be part of their curriculum, you know, yeah, make yeah. them see that. Yeah. And make them understand, you know, things like empathy and, man, you got it so good. Not everybody has it like you because you're not thinking like that as a kid, right? Oh, right. It's so important that we show that to them. So I just think there's so many opportunities. And man, Central PA is amazing. You mentioned Bethesda Mission, one of my favorites. Yeah, it's but amazing. But there's, there's so many groups doing amazing work. There are. And that's where, like to your point, everything's negative, everything's negative. You've got to balance that in your life. You can't just Absolutely. sit there and watch. Well, I shouldn't say this, watch the news, but you should watch the news. <laughs> um, you need to watch the news. <laughs> but you need to balance that with, man, I need to help that person down the street. Or, yeah. You know, even if it's as simple as, you know, somebody's parents pass and you're taking a meal to them or something. Yeah. And, that, and that's you know? kind of like where our driving force for this show is like there's a lot of positive and great things locally to right. the community. And do we want this to be bigger than just the community? Do we want to grow this show nationally? Of course we do. Mm-hmm. But the bottom line is our first and foremost cir- uh, focus has to be our local community. Right. As, as simple as, as that. Terms. But I think you guys are really nailing it. And, and you, like you say, you probably didn't start out that way. No. no. But just highlighting positive things like – You've had some great guests, Alex Irby. What a great young man. He's going to go so serve in our Navy and humble. humble. Yes. That kid could be like, oh, look at me. I'm the greatest quarterback. Instead, he's, he's humble. more mature than me. Exactly. He's 18. Yeah. So is his brother. <laughs> so and, Alex I'm, is the and I'm older than both of them combined ages <laughs> by like eight years. It's ridiculous. Now, I did want to say, so on, on uh, CBS 20, 21, uh-huh. okay, you're, it's always involved in the community. That's a huge thing. Mm-hmm. So some of the things that you do, and I want to bring this up, and I'm going to do some reading here, is raising money for many charities, including Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. Well, that's where we met. That's where we yeah. met. American Cancer Society and the Heart Americans, American Heart Association. Yeah, we just had our heart ball over the weekend. You yep. did, yep. Mm-hmm. And you can also mm-hmm. be found visiting schools, teaching your kids about weather with your unique and energy and your enthusiasm, which is amazing. Can you tell us a bit more like about how much you love doing it? Because to me... I wanted to bring you on here not as meteorologist, but as more MC philanthropist because that's you do a lot of that stuff, which is really important. Well, thank you. Um, you know, just as we talked about, it's it's satisfying to me. And I got to tell you, there's times I don't feel like doing it. Yeah. But when you you've made a commitment and you have to do it, and then after I'm like, I really like that. I know. <laughs> I know that feeling. But more important to me is I've met people like you. I mean, like we've been friends for 14 years or whatever. Now. Yeah. How cool is that? Yeah. You know what I mean? Oh, I know John. I love what he's doing. Now I know you. Yeah. I love what you're doing. And I think it's that, you know, those relationships that just spawn more good stuff. Right. So I like to meet good good people doing good stuff and highlight that. Now, fortunately, with my job, I can. Like, when I feel on the radio, I try to have some guests on that are doing good stuff. But there's so many people really trying um, and making a difference, making an impact. Even if it's small, they're still making an impact. And that is what needs to be, you know, sometimes I wish we could leave the newscast with that stuff. It yeah. always it always right. drops to the bottom of the newscast. Right. But, yeah. but it's there, man. And that's mm-hmm. that's what gets me fired up. So I really appreciate you guys yeah. doing this and yeah. highlighting this stuff. Yeah, yeah. and you, you even said to me, like we were texting, and I was like, what do you want to talk about? You're like, <laughs> no, I didn't know what we were talking about. <laughs> you're, you're like, I want to talk about what you guys are doing because right. I really enjoy it, which means like somebody like you, watching what we're doing to me is super flattering because yeah, like absolutely. first off you're in the news and like yeah. you're a tv personnel and you do a lot of great things so when we get compliments from people like yourself who are doing great things that just makes my drive even stronger to oh, do yeah. more absolutely you yeah. agree oh yeah for sure and and i, w- I would do want to highlight one thing that you've been talking about kind of as we go through this is um i think one thing that people miss about God, and I, I was a youth pastor. I actually just finished my tenure as a youth pastor. Oh, no kidding. Um, yeah, I did I did two years at my church, and recently I've just gotten way too busy in, in the, the work stuff and this kind of thing to to continue doing 100-hour work weeks. It was, it was a lot. Sure. But, um, yeah, one thing I wanted to highlight there that you were talking about is I think people, and this is just something I think we're, we're lacking because we're just so focused on self and consumption all the time, consumption of content and of food and of all, all the stuff in the world, right? 
I think we we miss the fact that I think God calls us to have a servant's heart, not just because it's good for society, but it's also good for us. That's yeah. a really good and, point. And I think we think of being a servant and be, and having a servant's heart as a kind of burden or something that we don't want to do. We have to have discipline to do it because it's not about us and all this stuff. Right. But I think what, what you highlighted there is you feel really good afterwards. And right. I, I don't think you feel really good afterwards after you do a bunch of consuming. I don't think <laughs> consuming on TikTok, no. it just makes you feel more empty. You no. know what I mean? You might have a brief second. Yeah, that's the thing. It's like that it's, quick fix. It's the same thing with addiction and alcohol. Yep. Like I used to get quick fixes. Like and, that, it's and, gone. And it's gone quick. But I can tell you when I I would have to go to like a meeting or something like that, 12 step, and I'm like, oh, oh my God. I tell yeah. me I'm leaving. I'm like, my gosh, I knew I needed to be there. Everything I needed to hear was there. Or, yeah. You know, it's a Sunday morning. I don't want to go to church. I go to church. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm so glad I went. Yeah. <laughs> that's always a great feeling. Well, I yeah. think you bring up a good point because what you guys are doing in this space, the space is filled with selfies and look at me and oh I'm gosh, so yeah. great. Yeah. And here you guys are highlighting positive people in a positive light and not just me, 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 me. I think that's the danger of social media is, Absolutely. you know, we're bringing up these kids where I got to have a better picture and especially girls, I got to use the filters that look oh, great yeah. and blah, blah, blah. Um, Even so, guys are doing that now. <laughs> I've seen them. <laughs> I do it every morning, Tom. <laughs> I'm like, his lashes aren't that long, Tom. Trust me. Uh, it's my, it's my <laughs> as long as we're confessing, I wear makeup on TV. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, hey, I, Nate did my makeup right before you got here. <laughs> shout out to Nate. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I think it's so uh, important. That, and that's why your show sticks out is because um, in those spaces where it is me, 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 you guys are highlighting the positive. Well, good. Well, yeah. you know, and, and I'm, I'll finish it with this. The, the, sure. the good hustle really is about mindset, right? And it's about, you know, like my hustle, his hustle, and like what drives us. Like, you know, you've been doing the news for 30 plus years. You know, what drives you still to this day? And also, you know, what advice would you give to somebody that wants to either do news or just needs some, some help with anything in the world? Well, I think you guys are a really good example of this you got to try it. You know, in TV and radio, I can't tell you how many people in the beginning say, oh, you'll never make it. Your voice isn't good enough. You're, you know, you're not, you're not good. You're not a a good looking guy or whatever. It was hard to do. I remember one of my first radio jobs, uh, the guy was, you know, old grizzly radio guy. And he goes, kid, you smoke? No, I don't smoke. Start. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> yeah little voice of yours you're gonna you know you sit there with a stogie on his oh mind. my god um, <laughs> that's hilarious. hilarious but there's so many examples like that where people are just you're never gonna make it you can't do it take that first step do the next right thing you guys took a leap of faith you you know you figured out hey we can set up this cool little studio a couple of mics and and now you're doing it yeah. so my advice to people is to do it you know i meet these young kids and they're like Oh, uh, well, I can't find a job. Well, I had to send out 50, you know, back in the day, they were cassette tapes, like yeah. VHS tapes, until somebody answered it. Yeah, I might have had to send out 50 before I got that one letter, Yeah, you know? Yeah. So keep trying, keep pushing, and man, tomorrow might be your day. Yeah, Next day might be your day, but it's going to be your day, mm-hmm. and, and you got to do it. So uh, my advice is just keep doing it. Yep. So thank you so much. I mean, we really enjoyed having you on here, and I think... The last statement I want to say is uh, don't quit five minutes before the miracle happens. Thanks for the truth. Thanks for being here. I love it. Thank you, guys. Good luck. Thank you so much, Tom. That was awesome.